Hello, my name is Floyd Maxwell, JustThinkIt.com. This video is a continuation of the Cosalt series, the consequences of a spring and loop theory series. And this one I call Spring and Loop Theory Takes on Wikipedia's List of Unsolved Problems in Physics. So I'm taking on the whole nine yards. So I have like a note, an extended note at the top here just to say that this web page it began life as Wikipedia's list of unsolved problems in physics. I took that page and then I've modified it and how it looks to make it look more like one of the pages on my site. I've the content, the actual questions are largely the same. There are some minor cases where I've changed things, but you'll see it's it's largely the same. So I'm I'm truly it's as if I've gone to Wikipedia's page and I'm answering those problems, those questions on that page. There was a long references section on this Wikipedia page that there's no reason to have it on this page because there's not questions in that section and I don't have to answer anything there, so it's being removed. Uh, in each of these sections, I use chevrons. Chevrons are those greater than and less than characters. I use those to denote when my content starts and stops. So it's think of it like you're reading a Wikipedia question and it's like, okay, chevrons, I say some stuff, closing chevrons, okay, back to Wikipedia kind of thing. And I use some color formatting so that you can tell the plainest of text is the original Wikipedia content. When it's in red, that's an actual question. I've identified a question within that content and I made the font a little bit bigger and it's red. When I answer it, I answer in green or spring and loop theory answers in green. And then if I quote from some other source, which can be a different Wikipedia page or a whole another website or whatever, I do it in black. All right, so let's get down to it. It's pretty organized. They put questions into categories like cosmology or quantum gravity or high energy particles, astronomy and astrophysics, nuclear physics, atomic stuff, condensed matter stuff, biophysics, and then other problems, miscellaneous. So let's go into the first section. And it says here, just before the first section, it says unsolved problems by subfield. The following is a list of unsolved problems grouped into broad areas of physics. In my mind, this sort of jumps around a little bit, and in part it does that because it's all tied together in physics. Physics isn't just a subject, it's the subject. It's our lives, it's our world, it's our universe, it's everything. Anything and everything you can think of is, is physics at its lowest levels. You know, you can talk about it from a physics point of view. You might think, well, yeah, you could say the same about chemistry or math or Certainly math, you could say that, but then you would lose everybody if you tried to talk about everything from a math point of view. You'd have one person sitting in the front row and there'd be no one else in the class. If you try and talk about everything from a chemistry point of view, there's a lot of things that you can't talk about. They're not interesting or there's no chemistry to them. They are pure physics. Biology is even more limited. Biology is sort of a categorizing thing. It categorizes living things and it's a subset, really, of physics of the world. Here we go. Category 1.1, Cosmology and General Relativity. As you can see, there's a link on cosmic inflation, so it means that if you hovered over this link, it goes to the Wikipedia page called Cosmic Inflation. And then here's the question. It says, is the theory of cosmic inflation correct? Now the question goes on, but I stop there because that's the first question. And I want to answer each and every individual question. So question number 0001. Is the theory of cosmic inflation correct? Well, it's interesting that this question was the first one because inflation is one of the more ludicrous aspects of the Big Bang Theory. That cosmic inflation page, if you go to it, is 14,000 words long. That's way bigger than the average Wikipedia page, and I consider it 14,000 words of nonsense. So no, the theory of cosmic inflation is not correct because it's ridiculous. In my uh, first consequences paper, the speed of light one, I covered this subject. I predicted that the speed of light was in fact greater in the past. Because it was greater in the past, that meant things could move faster and did move faster in the past. And so you didn't need this inflationary hack. Question two. So when it's in red, that's, that's from Wikipedia. So this is like the next portion of that paragraph. And if so, what are the details of this epoch? This epoch, this era, this time? Well, this, e this time is like any other time. Space continues to expand. As you'll find generally with spring and loop theory, it, it simplifies, but it also takes the whiz-bang, the bizarre, the outrageous, it takes that out of the physics as it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be there. And I have found it consistently can easily be removed. The more bizarre and weird something is, the more likely it, it can be removed. And the physics is better. The subject is less entertaining, but the physics is better. So this epoch is like any other time. 
space continues to expand. And that's really uh, probably another big difference between spring and loop theory and the other theories. The other theories say, boom, there was an explosion, which there's truly no evidence of. And then we had to have some weird stuff going on. And then, oh, wow, things are expanding differently than we expected. Well, there must be dark energy. And I don't need all that contradictory stuff. I just say there's always been something spring energy. It's always been there. The whole system is built on springs, which is to say ultra-powerful but ultra-small energy everywhere. That's our world. That's our life. That's our universe. Question three. What is the hypothetical inflaton field giving rise to invasion? That's sort of like a weird question, isn't it? You know, it's not even worded correctly. And you'll find that in, on this Wikipedia page, there's plenty of questions that aren't even worded correctly. So what is it? What is this hypothetical field? Well, I say it's hypothetical, just like in the question and in the link. When you read about it, it's hypothetical. So who cares? What's the real question there? Do I think there is an inflaton field? Absolutely not, for many reasons. But anyway, question four. If inflation happened at one point, is it self-sustaining through inflation of quantum mechanical fluctuations and thus ongoing in some impossibly distant place? So in other words, if we had this bizarre hack of inflation, can it somehow self-sustain somewhere? Is this bizarreness happening somewhere? No. The next series of questions are related to the horizon problem. So the problem is when you have an explosion is there's nothing uniform. From the moment something explodes, there's nothing uniform ever again until that thing stops exploding completely. You set off a hand grenade in hopefully a deserted shed and nothing about that shed is homogeneous afterwards. Once you pull that pin, homogeneity is gone. Well, like this question says, why is the distant universe so homogeneous? When the Big Bang theory seems to predict larger, measurable anisotropies, I'm not sure I say that, of the night sky than those observed. Well, I say never mind the distant universe. The entire universe is homogeneous because the Big Bang is not behind the expansion. This Big Bang is like, uh, well, it's like religion, and it's all over physics, cosmic physics, and it's too bad. We've got to get rid of that completely. We have, there's no reason to talk about Big Bang other than, you know, some group of people make a lot of money talking about it. All right, question six. Cosmological inflation is generally accepted as the solution, but are other possible explanations such as a variable speed of light more appropriate? Well, I say inflation is not accepted by spring and loop theory because it is a ludicrous fudge factor and not needed. Yes, there are other possible explanations. In COSALT 1, the speed of light, I predicted and calculated a variable speed of light. Third Wikipedia question or subject area. This question is about the future of the universe. Is the universe heading towards a big freeze? I say yes. Space will continue to expand without end. There has never been enough mass or matter density to slow down the expansion. But that's kind of boring, isn't it? That's like the opposite of a big fancy explosion. Trust me, it's the total opposite. Okay, question eight. Is the universe heading towards a big rip? You can look up what these terms are. Not interested in just repeating Wikipedia explanations, but basically the rip says uh, the expansion is going to accelerate even more than it is. For those who don't understand the, sort of the forces behind it, you know, these are genuine questions to them. They're like, well, first it was expanding at one rate, then there was inflation, then for some reason inflation slowed down, and now... And then we had a long period where it was, there was just explosion effects. And then today, now we've got this dark energy, and now it's expanding again. So you can see why people get all kind of frantic and confused and come up with crazy theories. Anyway, big rip, no. Expansion is not going to accelerate. If anything, it's going to slow down. Just like when you're inflating a balloon, and as, you, as a balloon gets bigger, your effect of each additional puff from your lungs is less. In other words, the balloon gets boring to watch at a certain point. You can hardly see it getting bigger. Until it breaks, then it's interesting. Question nine. Is the universe heading towards a big crunch? Is it all going to collapse on itself is what they're asking. No, there's no reason for space to contract at all, let alone all the way back to a, quote, singularity, quote. Question 10. Is the universe heading towards a big bounce? Well, it would have to collapse with a big crunch before it could possibly have a big bounce. So no, the big bounce is the least likely of the four theories or four questions, as it assumes each universe comes from, from a previous one. Spring loop theory can think of no way or reason for this to be the case. Question 11. Or is it part of an infinitely recurring cyclic model? So that would be infinite bounces. So no, 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 no. Infinity, no. Gravitational waves, next section. 
can gravitational waves be detected experimentally? Well, I say there's a there's an earlier question there. Do gravitational waves exist? Because there's, you know, it's one of these things we haven't detected yet, and they've been predicted, and, you know, they're a prediction of a theory. So do they exist? I think they do. I think they're possible. When I talked about gravity in my COSALT 5 talk, I say I think gravity waves, gravitational waves are possible. Question 13. Can gravitational waves be detected experimentally? I say gravitational waves happen when a change in gravity occurs. This happens when mass appears or disappears or is altered, i.e. through fission or fusion. But when mass changes, the change in energy from that mass change, the change in energy is literally the speed of light squared more than the change in gravity. And both of these propagate through the same spring system. So no, it is effectively impossible to measure a gravity wave just as it would be impossible to measure a hummingbird's heartbeat when that bird is at the center of a nuclear explosion. Next section, baryon asymmetry. Question 14, why is there far more matter than antimatter in the observable universe? Spring loop theory has a different conception of what matter is. Matter is stabilized loops of energy within a universal matrix of energy springs. Spring and loop theory would explain antimatter as a type of loop or spring loop system that, when combined with a loop, causes the two things to unroll, i.e. to go back to energy. In other words, antimatter is just another type of loop or matter. Spring and loop theory can think of no reason why there should have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter created during a Big Bang. This is just not a problem. Cosmological constant problem. Why does the zero-point energy of the vacuum not cause a large cosmological constant? That's what Wikipedia said, and I ask, is this a reasonable question? And I say, not really. First, we have to agree on what the zero-point energy is. Wikipedia says it is, quote, the lowest possible energy that a quantum mechanical physical system may have. It is the energy of its ground state. So, the zero-point energy refers to a physical system of which space has none. Question 16. Why does the zero-point energy of the vacuum not cause a large cosmological constant? So now, the unreasonable question number 15 has the words of the vacuum tacked onto it, where the vacuum is normally defined as free of matter, i.e. free of physical things. So the question still does not make sense. Question 17. Why is the measured vacuum energy a tiny fraction of the calculated vacuum energy? See, I've reworded that question. If we reword the question to one of measured versus calculated vacuum energies, then spring and loop theory can answer this. We measure temperature of matter systems. A thermometer requires atoms to hit it in order to record a temperature. When you put the thermometer in space, no atoms are hitting it. You know, almost none. Now, there's something like, on average in the universe, there's like four atoms of hydrogen per cubic meter. There's a higher density than that on Earth, so there's a lower density than that in space. So let's say three. You've got a thermometer in a cubic meter of space, and there's three atoms that might hit it. So basically none. So when you put that thermometer in space, no atoms are going to hit it. So the thermometer will radiate away its heat until it reaches the temperature of space, some fraction of a degree Kelvin, and that's the temperature we're going to measure. But spring and loop theory says that the universe is composed entirely of energy, ice springs, with a relatively few matter loops. So if you take away the matter loops, you still have that ultra-intense spring energy everywhere. But how can you measure it? If the comic book character Flash existed on Earth, how would we measure him? The something we are trying to measure in space is 100 billion billion times smaller than the smallest parts of us, and it moves at the speed of light. How do we plan to measure that? Our instruments are, and forever will be, too crude. Question 18, what cancels it out? Well, nothing. It's there, and we're just unable to measure it. All right, next section, dark matter. What is the identity of dark matter? Question 19. Spring loop theory says that dark matter is the phrase for our ignorance, and it's caused by the difference between how we think gravity works and how it actually works. And you can see my talk on gravity for more on that subject. So is dark matter a particle? Well, and I say that's difficult to say until we use a better model of gravity. In other words, we need to iterate using a better theory until we can eventually uh, reproduce in equations and computer simulations what we can measure, or not. If we don't measure it, well then, it suggests it's some other particle, or not. If we use spring and loop theory's model of gravity and still detect orbital discrepancies, then spring and loop theory would assume the differences from other particles. 
Spring and loop theory can conceive of particles smaller than those we currently know of, with sizes down to the Planck scale, so it has no reason to speculate further on dark matter at this time. Question 21. Is it the lightest superpartner, LSP? Well, this question is really asking, do you believe in supersymmetry? Spring loop theory does not. The longer answer is that spring loop theory has no need or reason to speculate on particle families, since it does not require them to stay self-consistent. You know, the super partners and supersymmetry, it requires these particle families, and it's kind of absurd. That's where physics just gets too theoretical. Spring loop theory prefers to ever more accurately simulate and iterate after beginning with a much simpler and more sound foundation. Question 22. Do the phenomena attributed to dark matter point not to some form of matter, but actually to an extension of gravity? And I say yes and no. Spring loop theory does not need dark matter, so yes, they point to something else. But no, an extension of gravity will not work. What is needed is a completely different conception of what gravity is. Spring loop theory provides this right out of the box. And there's a sentence on the large underground xenon experiment. Bottom line, there's no question in it, so we'll skip that. Dark energy. Question 23. What is the cause of the observed accelerated expansion of the universe? Spring loop theory says that the universe is composed of ultra-intense energy, dubbed the universal matrix. It is most easily thought of as vibrating springs. Spring loop theory says the ubiquitous spring-like energy is constantly expanding the size of the universe, but questions whether the observed expansion is in fact accelerating. If anything, spring loop theory thinks the opposite is occurring, that there is, and always has been, a gradual decrease in the expansion rate as, number one, the thing that is expanding gets bigger, and number two, the total energy of the system remains constant. Question 24. Why is the energy density of the dark energy component of the same magnitude as the density of matter at present, when the two evolve quite differently over time? This is another trick question that wants you to implicitly agree that there is a dark energy component, in addition to, I guess, non-dark components? Like from a Big Bang or something? Spring loop theory doesn't think that things got where they are today because of a Big Bang that supposedly occurred some dozen plus billion years ago. At this point, spring and loop theory tolerates the concept of a Big Bang, since this is how, supposedly, the magical ratios of hydrogen and helium were made. And since spring and loop theory has yet to devote much time to finding a way to completely rule out a Big Bang, spring and loop theory does not think there are two components, so they don't have to be, or can't be, reconciled. Question 25. Could it be simply that we are observing at exactly the right time? Many physicists would answer that with, this is so unlikely that it rules out something they want to rule out. Some would gladly rule out dark energy itself, but then they would still need to insert some other fudge factor in its place. Spring loop theory has already answered the larger question, and so has no need to be involved with this question. Question 26. Is dark energy a pure cosmological constant? Okay, first we need to decipher the question, translating it into the language of spring loop theory as... Is the universal matrix of ultra-high energy springs a pure cosmological constant? Spring loop theory is still bothered by the words pure and constant. The universal matrix of high energy springs is by no means one-dimensional. It is the ether, as I talked about in Cosalt 4. It's the ether that propagates all electromagnetic particles, waves, and energies. It, in combination with graviton loops, is what creates matter. Similarly, spring loop interactions create the strong and weak forces and gravity, so no to the first part. And no to the second part as well, in that the universal matrix is not constant. It is very uniform, as the CMB measurements confirm, but it is the largest living, breathing thing there is. Question 27. Or are models of quintessence applicable? Wikipedia says that quintessence is hypothesized as a fifth fundamental force and is, quote, not constant. Spring and loop theory has no need for the concept of quintessence and is able to explain dark energy using spring and loop theory itself. No changes to spring and loop theory are needed. No forces need to be added or removed. So, no. Question 28. Or are models of phantom energy applicable? Wikipedia's paltry phantom energy page says, Phantom energy is a hypothetical form of dark energy that is even more potent than the cosmological constant at increasing the expansion of the universe. So, phantom energy is some other dark energy. Well, spring and loop theory has no need for dark energy under that or a different name, so no. Next section, ecliptic alignment of CMB anisotropy. 
Question 29. Some large features of the microwave sky at distances of over 13 billion light years appear to be aligned with both the motion and orientation of the solar system. Is this due to systematic errors in processing, contamination of results by local effects, or an unexplained violation of the Copernican principle? The CMB is perhaps the most overleveraged thing physicists play around with, not counting the Big Bang. They seriously need to stop doing this. So yes. Shape of the universe. Question 30. What is the three manifold of co-moving space, i.e. of a co-moving spatial section of the universe informally called the shape of the universe? If spring and loop theory understands this question, it thinks the question is, when you factor out the fact that the universe is expanding, what does it look like? Spring and loop theory answers with no different. Question 31. Neither the curvature nor the topology is presently known though the curvature is known to be close to zero on observable scales. The cosmic inflation hypothesis suggests that the shape of the universe may be unmeasurable, but suggests that the shape may be blah blah blah, is the shape unmeasurable? Yes, it is unmeasurable, especially with our present non-understanding of gravity. To get anywhere close to understanding the universe at the billions of light years scale, we will first have to be able to model our own galaxy. Once we can do that, we should be able to scale things to the next galaxy, etc. Our understanding will grow with our models. Whether we will ever be able to actually measure the shape of the universe is a coin in a pot at the end of the rainbow. A rainbow we currently can't even see. Question 32. So is it a Poincaré space? Spring and Loop Theory would like to warn readers against following that Poincaré link on the grounds that it appears to be math mm, stimulation and therefore it's not safe for work. So no. Question 33, or is it a, another three manifold? Well, same warning, don't click that. So no. Next section, quantum gravity. Vacuum catastrophe. Why does the predicted mass of the quantum vacuum have little effect on the expansion of the universe? Because every theory of mass and gravity is wrong? Yes, because of that. I foolishly thought I wanted to understand this question, so I clicked on the humorously named Vacuum Catastrophe link and was redirected to the more sanely named Vacuum State page. Once there, I searched for the word mass and found this humdinger of a paragraph. If the quantum field can be accurately described through perturbation theory, then the properties of the vacuum are analogous to the properties of the ground state of a quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, or more accurately, the ground state of a QM problem. In this case, the vacuum expectation value, VEV, of any field operator vanishes for quantum field theories in which perturbation theory breaks down at low energies, for example, quantum chromodynamics or the BCS theory of superconductivity. Field operators may have non-vanishing vacuum expectation values called condensates. In the standard model, the non-zero vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field arising from spontaneous symmetry breaking is the mechanism by which the other fields in the theory acquire mass. Fans of paragraphs with lots of links in them will be all a Twitter at the 15 links contained in those run-on sentences. Mind you, ground state, perturbation theory, and vacuum expectation values were linked to twice, so there's really just 12 links. Personally, all I needed to see was Higgs to know it was a question not worth an answer. The Higgs is to the standard model as kalabi yau shapes are to string theory. A whole big fat bunch of complexity that doesn't work. As mentioned earlier, spring loop theory actually has a working theory of gravity, so it does not need to inhale from the Higgs bong. Next section, quantum gravity. Question 35. Can quantum mechanics be realized as part of a fully consistent theory? Spring and loop theory acknowledges that quantum mechanics, QM, has had a place in physics to date. A lot has been theorized and engineered by a lot of people. QM works and plays fairly well with others, but gravity, not part of the theory. Wikipedia's QM page says, it has proven difficult to construct quantum models of gravity. And it says that with a level of understatement I lack, apparently. Spring and Loop theory would add that QM will ultimately be supplanted by a better model of the smallest scales. Probability clouds will become city-sized models with matchbox-sized springs and building-sized matter loops. Question 36. Can general relativity be realized as part of a fully consistent theory? Spring and loop theory will replace relativity. It has already matched it and extended beyond it. And you can see previous COSALT talks for those references. Like much of physics, relativity is too complicated, blows up at endpoints, and fails to provide a simple model of how things actually work. 
Question 37. Is a quantum field theory the answer? Wikipedia's quantum field theory page says there is, quote, an underlying physical field and that particles are field quanta. Basically, quantum field theory gets things exactly backward, as I mentioned in my fourth co-salt talk about the ether. So, no. Question 38. Is space-time fundamentally continuous or discrete? I am not sure what theory thinks it is continuous. Okay, I checked, and apparently relativity does. Thanks, Wikipedia. While quantum mechanics thinks it is discrete. Spring loop theory sides with quantum mechanics on this one. Question 39. Would a consistent theory involve a force mediated by a hypothetical graviton? A consistent theory as opposed to the near infinity of inconsistent theories we have today? That would be nice. Well, first of all, as some have said, gravity is not a force. And mistake number one with gravitons is to imagine them as independent particles that fly around and occasionally bump into things. Mistake number two, made by classic physics, apparently, is to consider gravitons as massless. That can only lead to something else providing mass. Don't make me mutter the Higgs oath again. Spring loop theory does refer to its loops as gravitons. If you want spring loop theory to stop, it can. The important point is that in spring loop theory, gravitons, i.e. loops, don't mediate anything. They interact with springs, causing them to contract in size and creating an effect felt in the entire universal matrix. So no to the way classic physics thinks of gravitons. Question 40. Or be a product of a discrete structure of space-time itself, as in loop quantum gravity? No. Loop quantum gravity gets it wrong in the same way the other field theories do. Intuitive proof of this can be found in the loop quantum gravity page itself. It's got too many words, far too many formulas, and a closer read reveals sentences like, Loop quantum gravity is based only on quantum theory and general relativity, and its scope is limited to understanding the quantum aspects of the gravitational interaction. Well, since neither relativity nor quantum mechanics understand how gravity works, loop quantum gravity has no chance either. But I like how Lee Schmolin thinks, if that counts for anything. Question 41. Are there deviations from the predictions of general relativity at very small scales, or in other extreme circumstances that flow from a quantum gravity theory? Well, general relativity deviates from itself when it comes to small scales, so yes. Question 42. Are there deviations from the predictions of general relativity at very large scales or in other extreme circumstances that flow from a quantum gravity theory? General Relativity's wiki page lists some issues under the singularities heading. I think another deviation from general relativity is the speed of stars orbiting the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Their speeds do not drop off with distance from the black hole. Hence the introduction of the dark matter crutch. So, yes. Next section. Question 43. Do black holes produce thermal radiation as expected on theoretical grounds? The premise for black hole thermal radiation is the notion of a particle-antiparticle pair being created near the event horizon with one of them ultimately escaping the black hole's gravity. Quantum mechanics likes the idea of spontaneously creating particle-antiparticle pairs. Spring and loop theory does not. Spring and loop theory says that if a particle is created, modified, or unrolled, then it happens due to something acting on it, not to the random effects of the quantum foam. It is interesting to read that, quote, the simplest models of black hole evaporation lead to the black hole information paradox. So one problem's solution leads to another problem. The perpetual motion machine of modern physics is a great provider for those who get paid to speculate. Question 44. Does this radiation contain information about their inner structure, as suggested by gauge-gravity duality? When you click on that gauge-gravity duality link, it redirects you to the page on string theory. String theory explains nothing whatsoever, acting more like an elaborate test of one's patience. So no. Question 45. Or not, as implied by Hawking's original calculation? Well, this has been answered already, so no. Question 46. If not, and black holes can evaporate away, what happens to the information stored in them? Quantum mechanics does not provide for the destruction of information. Spring loop theory has stated that a black hole is where information goes to die. A black hole is an edge case that relativity does not properly handle. Apparently quantum mechanics doesn't properly handle it either. Cosal 2 black holes provides more on this subject. Question 47. Or does the radiation stop at some point leaving black hole remnants? No remnants, no radiation, no information retention, so no. Question 48. Is there another way to probe their internal structure somehow, if such a structure even exists? 
Yes, by modeling it. Spring Loop Theory will make a good foundation for such a model. Next section, extra dimensions. Question 49, does nature have more than four space-time dimensions? Well, spring and loop theory has no need for higher dimensions, so no. If so, what is their size? Well, we've already answered it. Question 51, are dimensions of fundamental property of the universe or an emergent result of other physical laws? Well, they're fundamental. Question 52, can we experimentally observe evidence of higher spatial dimensions? No. The next section is called the Cosmic Censorship Hypothesis and the Chronology Protection Conjecture. Question 53. Can singularities not hidden behind an event horizon, known as naked singularities, arise from realistic initial conditions? Wikipedia says the theoretical existence of naked singularities is important because their existence would mean that it would be impossible to observe the collapse of an object to infinite density. Spring loop theory thinks the notion of infinite density is about as wrong as relativity gets, so no. Question 54. Or is it possible to prove some version of the cosmic censorship hypothesis of Roger Penrose, which proposes that this is impossible? Spring loop theory is not all that interested in a theory attempting to disprove a theory that spring loop theory already thinks is false, so don't care. Question 55. Similarly, will the closed time-like curves which arise in some solutions to the equations of general relativity and which imply the possibility of backwards time travel be ruled out? Tell you what, you answer the how many monkeys does it take to randomly produce every work of Edward de Vere and spring and loop theory will answer this one. Question 56. Or be ruled out by a theory of quantum gravity which unites general relativity with quantum mechanics. We need more than unification of two deficient theories, so no. But yes to spring and loop theory, a new theory that explains gravity, and that could be called a theory of quantum gravity if one was both unoriginal and inordinately obsessed with preserving past relics. Question 57. As suggested by the chronology protection conjecture of Stephen Hawking, time travel is like thinking you will win the lottery a billion times in a row. Spring and loop theory thinks that physicists indulge far too much in time travel scenarios. For what it's worth, spring and loop theory does not specifically preclude time travel. Locality. Next section. Question 58. Are there non-local phenomena in quantum physics? First of all, there is a quantum non-locality Wikipedia page that is twice as long and doesn't have a, quote, this article may require cleanup to meet Wikipedia's quality standards banner. So I'm not sure why it wasn't linked to here instead of the principle of locality page. Spring and loop theory does not think entanglement happens, frankly, that it will ultimately be explained by other phenomena. So, no. Question 59. If they exist, are non-local phenomena limited to the entanglement revealed in the violations of the Bell inequalities? Already answered, not relevant in a spring and loop theory explained world. Question 60. Or can information in conserved quantities also move in a non-local way? Already answered, not relevant in a spring loop theory explained world. Question 61. Under what circumstances are non-local phenomena observed? Already answered. Question 62. What does the existence or absence of non-local phenomena imply about the fundamental structure of the space of space-time? The absence of non-local phenomena implies that space works in a simpler, more local way than quantum non-locality would suggest. Question 63. How does this relate to quantum entanglement? Already answered, not relevant in a spring loop theory explained world. Question 64. How does this elucidate the proper interpretation of the fundamental nature of quantum physics? It shows that quantum mechanics produces the same kind of dilemmas as relativity. Next section, high energy physics or particle physics. See also beyond the standard model. Higgs mechanism, question 65. Are the branching ratios of the Higgs boson consistent with the standard model? Spring and loop theory thinks the Higgs, particle, field, boson, is flawed, as mentioned above and in Cosalt 5 gravity. So don't care. Question 66. Is there only one type of Higgs boson? Let's hope so. Next section, hierarchy problem. Question 67, why is gravity such a weak force? Spring loop theory says that gravity is the only force that is not a direct spring loop interaction. Rather, it is an effect propagating through the universal matrix of springs when a loop is introduced or removed. When you clamp part of a fishnet, there is a small effect felt everywhere in the net. That small effect is gravity propagated 
Considering that analogy further, the act of clamping the fishnet is the strong force. Removing the clamp is the weak force. And the net itself is the electromagnetic force. Clearly, the gravity effect is many times smaller than any of the other three forces. Question 68. Gravity becomes strong for particles only at the Planck scale around 10 to the 19 billion electron volts, much above the electroweak scale 100 electron volts, the energy scale dominating physics at low energies. Why are these scales so different from each other? Gravity is a small, in fact Planck scale, change in the spring matrix. An analogy used in the original explanation of spring and loop theory is a dance floor. During a chaotic dance, like rock music at Woodstock, each dancer takes up a fair bit of space. Change the music to a slow dance, and pairs of dancers take the floor, with their dancing taking up less space. The change in dancers, i.e. the introduction of a gravity-creating loop, is substantial at the smallest scale, but move just one atom away. And at the scale of dancers, that would put the next pair of dancers about one million light-years away, and the effect of the slow dancers is almost non-existent. The weak force is the spring lashing around on being released from a spring loop bond. Behaving like a fire hose, it creates an effect over a wide area due primarily to the raw power of that spring-like energy. We know the weak force is behind the atomic bomb, so compare the force of an atomic bomb to that of two lovebirds dancing. Only when you get inside the lovebirds' world is their love dominant, but one atomic bomb can ruin their whole day. Question 69. What prevents quantities at the electroweak scale, such as the Higgs boson mass, from getting quantum corrections on the order of the Planck scale? Higgs? Bah humbug. Nonsense theory is nonsense. Answered earlier with the words, don't care. Question 70. Is the solution supersymmetry? To the Higgs? No. The solution to the Higgs is to get rid of that nonsensical theory. Is the solution extra dimensions? Extra dimensions are a major problem, i.e. a spectacularly bad hack, in themselves. They solve absolutely nothing. Away with them. And the Higgs. So, no. Question 72. Is the solution just anthropic fine-tuning? Anthropic fine-tuning equals hack the model to fit your weird theory. Knock yourself out. Next section. Magnetic monopoles. Question 73. Did particles that carry magnetic charge exist in some past high-energy epoch? So, did magnetic monopole particles exist in the past? No. Spring and loop theory says that magnetism is a propagated effect, an effect that would not have changed since shortly after a Big Bang, if such a thing occurred. Question 74. If so, do any remain today? Only in the mind of physicists. Question 75. Paul Dirac showed the existence of some types of magnetic monopoles would explain charge quantization. Good for him. That quantization mention is a tip-off to this being another quantum mechanics problem solution. Spring and loop theory is a more fundamental explanation than quantum mechanics and is no more troubled by monopoles than by the diseases of the super rich. Next section, proton decay and spin crisis. Question 76. Is the proton fundamentally stable? That's hard to say. The spring and loop theory model will need to be built up to the point that we can determine this. Question 77. Or does it decay with a finite lifetime as predicted by some extensions to the standard model? Well, I've answered that already. By the way, does it matter? Other than backing up some old flawed theory? Question 78. How do the quarks and gluons carry the spin of protons? Spring and loop theory hopes to talk about this in a future paper. Next section, supersymmetry. Question 79. Is space-time supersymmetry realized at trillion electron volt scales? Stop wasting money on ever larger particle smashing boondoggles. And no. Susie is what happens when you take a theory too far. Like the alleged information paradox in a black hole. Only more costly. Question 80. If so, what is the mechanism of supersymmetry breaking? Supersymmetry is broken, like the Higgs. That needs Susie. So get rid of Susie first, and the Higgs will fall on its own sword. Question 81. Does supersymmetry stabilize the electroweak scale? Answered already, so no. Does supersymmetry prevent high quantum corrections? Susie prevents progress in physics. So fight the power, and fight Susie, even if you have to bite. Question 83. Does the lightest supersymmetric particle, LSP, comprise dark matter? Of course it does. Now can we get back to watching American Gladiators? Or no? Generations of matter, next section. Question 84. Why are there three generations of quarks and leptons? Great question. The second best question so far. 
the why is gravity weak question was the first. Spring and loop theory thinks there are three generations of quarks and leptons, i.e. only three, because of stability issues. In short, there happen to be three, but beyond that, the building blocks get too flimsy. Simulations based on spring loop theory will be required before more can be said. Question 85. Is there a theory that can explain the masses of particular quarks and leptons in particular generations from first principles? Spring and loop theory thinks it can do this in time. Watch for a future talk on this, but don't hold your breath waiting for hard numbers. Question 86. A theory of Yukawa couplings? Yukawa couplings are a descriptive tool that appear to be used mainly to prop up Susie and the Higgs. Grrr. So, no. Next section. Electroweak symmetry breaking. Question 87. Question 87. What is the mechanism responsible for breaking the electroweak gauge symmetry, giving mass to the W and Z bosons? When you click on that electroweak symmetry breaking link, it redirects you to the Higgs mechanism page. Insert your expletive du jour. Spring loop theory says if you have a mass question, think loops. By the way, life is too short for the Higgs. Consider a root canal instead. Question 88. Is it the simple Higgs mechanism of the standard model? <laughs> that was funny, the way you use simple and Higgs in the same sentence. So no. Question 89. Or does nature make use of strong dynamics in breaking electroweak symmetry as proposed by Technicolor? I caught Technicolor at the Hollywood Bowl in 1987. In fairness, Technicolor theories are trying to move beyond the standard model and the Higgs. So God bless them, everyone. But no. Next section, neutrino mass. Question 90. What is the mass of neutrinos? Well, this is the third great question so far, and it's a real stumper. In the original paper, spring loop theory speculated that maybe neutrinos are in the shape of a ball. We have springs, we have matter loops. Matter loops interact with the springs. We can sort of imagine that. You know, you hold your finger up in the shape of a loop and hook another finger inside there. You can imagine that interaction. And similarly, if you have a ball, you can imagine it's kind of hard to hook a ball. So it's kind of easy to imagine that a ball would have little or no interaction with matter and springs, which is, of course, what we detect with neutrinos. But beyond that, what the mass is, no idea. Good question. Legitimate question. Question 91. Do neutrinos follow Dirac statistics? Spring loop theory would say no, simply because neutrinos are totally different from all other particles, including electrons. Question 92. Do neutrinos follow Majorana statistics? As answered earlier, spring loop theory thinks antimatter is just another type of loop or matter, admittedly one that happens to be able to unroll both itself and another spring loop system at the same time. So, no. Question 93. Is mass hierarchy normal or inverted? Is the question poorly worded or vague? The neutrino page does not even list the word hierarchy, but the Susie page does right before mentioning the Higgs boson. So, a non-issue to spring and loop theory. Question 94. Is the CP violating phase zero? Another symmetry question. Another non-issue to spring and loop theory. Next section. Asymptotic confinement. Question 95. Why has there never been measured a free quark or gluon, but only objects that are built out of them, like mesons and baryons? Well, why is it almost impossible to produce, store, and look at pure fluorine? Answer, reactivity. Well, it's the same with gluons, i.e. springs, only a hundred billion billion times more so. Mind the children when unattached springs are about. Question 96. How does this phenomenon emerge from QCD? It is one thing to be asked for theories to explain things we don't understand. It is quite another to be asked to fix broken theories like quantum chromodynamics. It is left as an exercise for the reader to read the first screen of the quantum chromodynamics page to find the answer to this question. Strong CP problem and axions. Question 97. Why is the strong nuclear interaction invariant to parity and charge conjugation? This is a particle-antiparticle symmetry breaking concern and a big deal for quantum chromodynamics. In fact, it appears to bust it. Spring loop theory is undaunted. Question 98. Is Pecky Quinn theory the solution to this problem? Fix your own broken theory. Next section. Anomalous magnetic dipole moment. Question 99. Why is the experimentally measured value of the muon's anomalous magnetic dipole moment, and that's muon G-2, 
significantly different from the theoretically predicted value of that physical constant. While this question seems to impact quantum electrodynamics as opposed to quantum chromodynamics. So pretty much the same fix your own borked theory comment as for the previous two questions. Sigh. If only there was a more fundamental theory available. Hmm. Next section, proton size puzzle. Question 100. What is the true charge radius of the proton? Okay, first of all, there does not appear to be a proton size puzzle page on Wikipedia. So the hyperlink on this page has been changed to a Wikipedia search for proton size puzzle. On reading the brief charge radius page, there is a brief mention of a proton charge radius discrepancy in muonic hydrogen. Spring and loop theory assumes that muonic hydrogen, i.e. a pseudo hydrogen where you use muons instead of, I forget what, I think electrons, is sufficiently different from regular hydrogen in your morning cup of coffee to make a difference. Proving once again that different things are different. Hey, if you don't like the answer, fix the question. Next section, astronomy and astrophysics. Question 101, why do the accretion disks surrounding certain astronomical objects, such as the nuclei of active galaxies, emit relativistic jets along their polar axes? The fourth good question so far. Spring loop theory says that springs emit or transmit electromagnetic radiation. Black hole is a runaway implosion. Older readers may recall being cautioned to not kick your television as it might implode. The implication being that something would come flying out of that imploding television. As to why the jets come out of the poles of the black hole, the bottom line is the alignment of springs when they are inclined to emit. If you squeeze something, it comes out where you are not squeezing. The poles are the least squeezed place in a black hole i.e. the least mass is there to do the squeezing. The springs of the universal matrix are inherently omnidirectional, so if you squeeze them here, they will naturally want to pop out there. Question 102. Why are there quasi-periodic oscillations in many accretion disks? Everything is connected by its mass, i.e. gravity. Things going into the spinning black hole unevenly would cause an uneven spin. Toss stuff unevenly onto a spinning merry-go-round and you will cause its speed to vary. Spring loop theory imagines quasi-periodic oscillations of black holes are the rule, not the exception. Question 103. Why does the period of these oscillations scale as the inverse of the mass of the central object? Okay, so period of oscillation equals time between oscillations. All right, so restating it. Why does the time between oscillations decrease as the black hole mass increases? Okay, so the emitted frequency goes up with the black hole mass. Well, more black hole mass equals more gravity. More gravity equals crush stuff up faster. Faster equals higher frequency. Question 104. Why are there sometimes overtones? Wikipedia says an overtone is any frequency higher than the fundamental frequency of a sound. Well, this could be caused by stuff falling in at a different rate. Are these overtones constant for a given black hole? Assuming they are, then maybe there are two or more things being eaten up at the same time. Question 105. And why do these appear at different frequency ratios in different objects? Different sized objects being sucked into different sized black holes will create different frequencies. Next section. Coronal heating problem. Question 106. Why is the sun's corona, atmosphere layer, so much hotter than the sun's surface? Good question number five. Spring loop theory says that heat we can measure requires loops, i.e. matter, that's changing in some way. In the sun, loops are being unrolled when the proton goes away and rolled when neutrons are created. So loops are changing. Relativity says when mass is lost, energy is created. Spring and loop theory says when a loop is unrolled and a new smaller loop created, the net effect is springs are released and more available to vibrate. And this vibration is detected as energy. So inside the sun, the number of loops is decreasing. So there's a net freeing up of springs. But by themselves, springs emit no heat we can detect, hence the coldness of empty space. But when those additional springs are freed up, they want to clamp onto stuff, i.e. loops. Inside the sun, this is already happening to a near maximum extent due to the extreme pressure. The hydrogen in the sun is compressed to a density 10 times that of lead. Summary, the uncompressed atmosphere of the sun to newly released springs is like additional oxygen to a fire. As in a Bunsen burner, the hottest point is some distance from where the fuel first meets the flame. 
This is where simulating spring and loop theory will come in handy, bringing an understanding of this process to a wider audience. Question 107. Why is the magnetic reconnection effect many orders of magnitude faster than predicted by standard models? Spring and loop theory imagines that this process is one of the most spring-dominated processes there is. And springs are ultra-energetic, far beyond particle energies. So it is easy to imagine such a process happening faster than less spring-dominated processes. Physicists today do not yet work with springs. They should. Next section, diffuse interstellar bands. What is responsible for the numerous interstellar absorption lines detected in astronomical spectra? Wikipedia says, the strength of diffuse interstellar bands is broadly correlated with the interstellar extinction, i.e. absorption and scattering, of electromagnetic radiation by dust and gas between an emitting astronomical object and the observer. Well, that seems reasonable. Question 109. Are they molecular in origin? Seems reasonable. Question 110. And if so, which molecules are responsible for them? To be determined. Question 111. How do they form? Well, first find out what molecules are doing this. The number of ways to make a thing are limited. Propose some theories, test them, confirm or discard your theories. Then go have a root beer. There are more important things to think about. Next section, gamma ray bursts. Question 112. How do these short duration, high intensity bursts originate? Physicists seem to have a pretty good handle on this one. Spring loop theory would add the basic point that the greatest energies come from the unrolling of loops. So that would narrow it down to stellar implosions and explosions or black hole activities. Next section, supermassive black holes. Question 113, what is the M sigma relation? Wikipedia says the M sigma relation is an empirical correlation between the stellar velocity dispersion of a galaxy bulge and the mass M of the supermassive black hole at the galaxy's center. So some kind of feedback maintains the connection between black hole mass and stellar velocity dispersion. Question 114. What is the origin of the M sigma relation between supermassive black hole mass and galaxy velocity dispersion? Okay, I'm not sure if this, is, this question is of general interest. For those interested, keep working on it. You may figure it out. You know, it's like asking, what is the relationship between the height of a tree and its width? You know, that just doesn't seem to be all that interesting a question. Question 115. How did the most distant quasars grow their supermassive black holes up to 10 to the 9 solar masses, i.e. a billion solar masses, so early in the history of the universe? Well, that's a much better question. Spring loop theory is not a prisoner of the Big Bang theory. A theory that says that pretty much only hydrogen and helium were created in the beginning. Spring and loop theory thinks it is quite probable that when the universe was much younger, there were big clumps of stuff. And unless these clumps burned, they would ultimately stay together forever due to gravity. So what stuff doesn't burn? Well, the elements heavier than carbon don't. So spring and loop theory would say that at some earlier time, there were clumps of heavier than carbon elements that stayed together and became black holes due to the amount of material involved. The Kuiper Cliff this is the next section, question 116. Why does the number of objects in the solar system's Kuiper Belt fall off rapidly and unexpectedly beyond a radius of 50 astronomic units? The dynamics of the solar system seem to dictate what ends up where. Some areas seem to be more unstable, others seem to be more stable. Model the solar system and figure it out, if that be your pleasure. Next section, flyby anomaly. Question 117, why is the observed energy of satellites flying by Earth sometimes different by a minute amount from the value predicted by theory? Because our present theories of gravity lack substance? Spring and loop theory includes an actual model of how gravity works. Try using it to simulate satellite flyby paths. If it produces better results, you will have used spring and loop theory to make its author rich. If it produces worse results, this answer will be deleted. Next section, galaxy rotation problem. Question 118, is dark matter responsible for differences in observed and theoretical speed of stars revolving around the center of galaxies? Yes, our ignorance is responsible. Spring and loop theory, now with less ignorance. Question 119, or is it something else responsible for the difference between observed and theoretical speeds of stars revolving around the center of galaxies? The something else is our wrong, inaccurate model of gravity. Spring and loop theory can do better. Next section, supernovae. Question 119, what is the exact mechanism by which an implosion of a dying star becomes an explosion? Okay, I'm not sure how exact you want it. Basic principles say that when you compress something, or heat it up, 
reactions take place more quickly. In the case of a star, as it reaches the end of its life, having gone through its hydrogen and helium and carbon fuel, it starts to fuse things into iron. Unfortunately, this process takes energy rather than liberating it. The star proceeds to use up all its heat to drive the lighter stuff into iron reaction. As the heat gets used up, the volume of the star must decrease by basic principles. In the case of a star, this last reaction happens very quickly, so, so quickly that it is an explosive collapse, taking a, about a second or so. The explosive collapse forces things together under more intense pressure than before, much like how the atomic bomb works. So the ingredients, a bunch of iron, carbon, helium, and hydrogen, and the unusually intense pressure cause new elements to form. Spring loop theory imagines that at some point the things being created take up more space than they have been given, like what happens inside a hand grenade after you pull the pin. A supernova is the result. Next section, ultra high energy cosmic ray. Question 120. Why is it that some cosmic rays appear to possess energies that are impossibly high? The so-called OMG particle. Well, when you click on that link, you find out that there has been measured a single OMG particle. And as interesting as the story of that one particle is, we need a whole lot more than one measurement, one tall tale, before we rush to the presses with our new theories. Question 121. Given that there are no sufficiently energetic cosmic ray sources near the Earth, well, it's answered already. Wait for more OMGs or go back to watching the football game. Question 122. Why is it that apparently some cosmic rays emitted by distant sources have energies above the Grayson, Zapsapin, Kuzmin limit? Well, we've answered that already. Next section. Rotation rate of Saturn. Question 123. Why does the magnetosphere of Saturn exhibit a slowly changing periodicity close to that at which the planet's clouds rotate? Earth has a molten and or solid iron core, so it creates a relatively centralized and stable magnetic field. Saturn is mostly gas. Maybe some of that gas, due to its composition, is able to create a magnetic field. Well, the gas is rotating sympathetically with the planet's rotation, so the field will as well. Question 124. What is the true rotation rate of Saturn's deep interior? Only Saturn's hairdresser knows for sure. Look, it's mostly a gas. Who says the interior does anything different than any other part of it? Putting on its wild speculation spectacles, Spring Loop Theory says that Saturn has exactly 1.26 jillion tons of rock salt at its core, that is a mere 26,000 furlongs in diameter, with the remainder of its hairdo being a mix of American and Swiss cheese. Does this question really belong on this page? Next section, origin of magnetar magnetic field. Question 125, what is the origin of magnetar magnetic field? Good question. Spring loop theory would say that such extreme magnetism is some form of spring effect and hopes to take a better stab at it in the future. The best guess, liberated springs creating a higher than normal spring density in the region of the magnetar. The springs have nowhere to go other than trying harder than normal to push space apart. And so they send out very frequent and very high intensity pulses that appear to observers as extreme magnetism. Next section, space roar. Question 126, why is space roar six times louder than expected? Ah, the space roar. Spring and Loop Theory first covered this when it presented the original theory. The short answer, because we have not been correctly modeling what space is. Question 127, what is the source of space roar? Spring and Loop Theory says that fundamentally the space roar comes from the ultra intense energy of the universal matrix of springs. Maybe space, i.e. springs, really do create those virtual particles, pairs, and then they collide with each other, creating sound. Model it with spring and loop theory and see what you find out. Next section, age, metallicity, relation, and the galactic disk. Question 128, is there a universal age, metallicity, relation in the galactic disks? A sample of 229 nearby thick disk stars have been used to investigate the existence of an age, metallicity, relation. Results indicate that there is indeed an age, metallicity, relation present in the thick disk. Okay, the heading for this section lacked a link, so I put one in there. Thick disk without a space in between there it seems to be a typo. Furthermore, it seems a better question to ask is why is there such a relation? Spring and loop theory doesn't much care in that this is a high level question, whereas physics today is stuck with low level problems. Next section nuclear physics. Question 129 The island of stability in the proton versus neutron number plot for heavy nuclei. Well, grammatically, that's not a question. The question might be, why does the island of stability observation correlate with how some heavy elements are more stable than others? 
Spring Loop Theory thinks the Island of Stability concept is the thin edge of the wedge, with the wedge being a better understanding of stuff at the Planck scale. In other words, things are more physical at the lowest level. As opposed to particles that magically do things, things happen because of mechanics. The sooner we turn to modeling instead of firing stuff at other stuff, the sooner we begin to make actual progress in understanding Planck scale stuff. Build with atomic bricks is greater than destroying with atomic guns. Quantum chromodynamics. Next section. Question 130. What are the phases of strongly interacting matter? Such a poorly worded question. Apparently, phases of strongly interacting matter is a buzz phrase on the QCD matter page. While spring and loop theory has already expressed its thinly veiled contempt for QCD or quantum chromodynamics. So, this question has already been answered. In that spring and loop theory has a completely different way of modeling phases of strongly interacting matter. Question 131. And what roles do they play in the cosmos? Hamlet and King Lear? Question 132. What is the internal landscape of the nucleons? If QCD is such a great theory, why do the most important parts of this attempt at being a unifying theory of the strong force end up on this page as questions to one and all? Oh uh, yeah, so like we have figured out how flactoids work, except for their shape and size and how they go together. Question 133. What does QCD predict for the properties of strongly interacting matter? Nothing, apparently. But boy, we could sure use some answers. Anyone? Question 134. What governs the transitions of quarks and gluons into pions and nucleons? Research dollars? Question 135. What is the role of gluons and gluon self-interactions in nucleons and nuclei? Define dollar wisecrack. Insert dollar wisecrack. Question 136. What determines the key features of QCD? Good question. Question 137. And what is their relation to the nature of gravity? Don't you dare. Don't even think about mentioning gravity in the same breath as QCD. I think I officially dislike QCD more than the Higgs, which is saying something, and saying a lot more than QCD theory does, apparently. Question 138. And what is their relation to the nature of space-time? Incestuous? Question 139. Do glue balls exist? Yes. Check the underside of your chair. Question 140. Do gluons acquire a mass dynamically? Wow, the third time gluons is linked in one paragraph. Why? Never mind. So yes. Make that no. Or yes. Question 141. Do gluons have zero rest mass? Even the poorly defined rest mass gets muddier when linked to the mighty QCD river of brown. Q142. Do gluons have zero rest mass within hadrons? This must be what it was like to be called before the McCarthy hearings. Question 143. Does QCD truly lack CP violations? QCD truly lacks balls. Next section. Nuclei and nuclear astrophysics. Question 144. What is the nature of the nuclear force that binds protons and neutrons into stable nuclei and rare isotopes? Good question. Mind you, after that QCD fiasco, if you had asked me what time is it, I think I would have wanted to jump up and hug you. In answering the question, what is the nature of the nuclear force? Spring loop theory would say geometry or mechanics. You need to model with a good theory like spring loop theory, and you will find out it is indeed a geometric, mechanical inevitability. Question 145. What is the origin of simple patterns in complex nuclei? Spring loop theory would say simple building blocks, the only kind spring loop theory has. Question 146. What is the nature of exotic excitations in nuclei at the frontiers of stability? Uh, something exotic? Question 147. What is the role of exotic excitations in nuclei in stellar processes? Seriously? Something exotic and far away. Question 148. What is the nature of neutron stars? When you visit the Wikipedia page on neutron stars, you find no controversy, no problem section. So what the heck is the question? I mean, doesn't this excerpt say it all? Neutron stars are the endpoints of stars whose mass after nuclear burning is greater than the Chandrasekhar limit for white dwarfs, but whose mass is not great enough to overcome the neutron degeneracy pressure to become black holes. Question 149. What is the nature of dense nuclear matter? Already answered with poor question. 
Question 150. What is the origin of the elements in the cosmos? Costco? Question 151. What are the nuclear reactions that drive stars and stellar explosions? Revenge against Greenpeace? Next section. Atomic, molecular, and optical physics. Hydrogen atom. Question 152. What is the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom in arbitrary electric and magnetic fields? The quality of the questions on this page has definitely deteriorated. This question appears to have been answered 90 years ago when Einstein enthusiastically endorsed Schrodinger's 1926 paper. Next section. Helium atom. The helium atom is the simplest three-body problem in quantum mechanics. Is the helium atom the simplest three-body problem in quantum mechanics? It appears to be the simplest that we know of. Spring and loop theory can envisage a near infinity of bodies, most either small and or unstable. Modeling will ultimately determine their relative stabilities and properties. Question 153. While approximations to a solution to the Schrodinger equation for helium exist, can an exact solution to the Schrodinger equation for the helium atom be found? Spring and loop theory is more interested in working on the problem with a better theory than quantum mechanics. Spring and loop theory is to quantum mechanics as an LCD is to a CRT. Next section, muonic hydrogen. Is the radius of muonic hydrogen inconsistent with the radius of ordinary hydrogen? Question 154. Already answered, so yes, different things are still different. Condensed matter physics, high temperature superconductors. Question 155. What is the mechanism that causes certain materials to exhibit superconductivity at temperatures much higher than around 25 degrees Kelvin? This field, and thus humanity, will benefit from the modeling of spring and loop theory. But spring and loop theory believes that companies should pay for their own research. Question 156. Is it possible to make a material that is a superconductor at room temperature? Yes, it is. Any camel that recently passed through the eye of a needle knows this. Next section. Amorphous solids. Question 157. What is the nature of the glass transition between a fluid or regular solid and a glassy phase? It is of the nature of something happening at a tiny scale that we do not have a good model of. Although there was a story just recently on phys.org, phys.org, where physicists claim to have ended a 20-year-old debate about glassy surfaces. You might want to check it out. Question 158. What are the physical processes giving rise to the general properties of glass? Small ones? Question 159. What are the physical processes giving rise to the general properties of the glass transition? Uh, those same small ones? Next section. Cryogenic electron emission. Question 160. Why does the electron emission in the absence of light increase as the temperature of a photomultiplier is decreased? Great question. This effect was first noticed 50 years ago, yet Wikipedia has no page on the subject. Spring loop theory would suggest that the photomultiplier, a device designed to detect extremely small quantities of photons, i.e. spring bumps, could be simply picking up bigger than average spring bumps. You know, those 100-year waves? Next section. Somnoluminescence. Question 161. What causes the emission of short bursts of light from imploding bubbles in a liquid when excited by sound? When you crack a whip, the tip moves at the speed of sound. Springs move at the speed of light. When you crack a bubble, i.e. when the bubble pops, the long-chain soap molecules whip around. Spring and loop theory can imagine one or more of the bubble molecules moving some part of itself at light speed due to this microscopic whip cracking effect. Next section, turbulence. Question 162. Is it possible to make a theoretical model of turbulence? Eventually, yes. Spring and loop theory is authored by a chemical engineer who gets that turbulence is one of those holy grail subjects to a chemical engineer. Still, we will have to do the first works first. So do your homework and brush your teeth, kids. Question 163. Is it possible to make a model to describe the statistics of a turbulent flow? Answer. Is it possible to model the internal structure of turbulent flow? Answer. Question 165. Also, under what conditions do smooth solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations exist? Answer. 166. This problem is also listed as one of the Millennium Prize problems in mathematics. Alphvenic turbulence is the in the solar wind and the turbulence in solar flares, coronal mass ejections, and the magnetospheric substorms are major unsolved problems in space plasma physics. Answered. Next section. Topological order. Question 167. What is topological order? 
Well, you can click the link provided and it seems to give a pretty good answer. Question 168. Is topological order stable at non-zero temperature? On clicking the linked phrase above, the author discovered a page full of complex concepts and theories. One theory, the one the page is named for, being newer than the rest. These types of questions should be grouped within a section. And as soon as one can show that the section has major flaws, then none of the sub-questions need to be answered. And in fact, the whole section can be removed or moved. Working theories, people. Working theories. Question 169. Equivalently, is it possible to have three-dimensional self-correcting quantum memory? I was just about to ask that. Next section. Fractional Hall Effect. Question 170. What is the fractional quantum Hall Effect? See the answer to the previous question. Question 171. What mechanism explains the existence of the V equals 5 over 2 state in the fractional quantum Hall Effect? See the answer to the previous question. Question 172. Does it describe quasi-particles? See the answer to the previous question. And question 173. Does it describe quasi-particles with non-abelian fractional statistics? No. Only David Letterman can describe those. Next section. Bose-Einstein condensation. Question 174. How do we rigorously prove the existence of Bose-Einstein condensates for general interacting systems? Another poorly written question. When you visit that Bose-Einstein condensation page, you find that everyone is fine with Bose-Einstein condensates. They can be created, they have properties, and they go away when you sneeze. Rather than rigorously proving the existence of them, don't you want to know how they work? If so, you need a model. One that understands basic stuff like, you know, gravity. Next section, liquid crystals. Question 175. What is the pneumatic phase transition? something that Wikipedia explains with pretty pictures. Question 176. What is the smetic bracket A bracket phase transition? Also something that Wikipedia explains with pretty pictures. Question 177. Can the pneumatic to schmectic phase transition in liquid crystal states be characterized as a universal phase transition? The question writer linked the word universal above to a Wikipedia page on background independence. And when you go there, the word universal does not appear. What gives with the questions in the latter half of this page? Spring and Loop Theory still thinks companies should pay for their own research. Next section, semiconductor nanocrystals. Question 178, what is non-parabolicity? Wikipedia doesn't have a page on this word. Question 179, what is energy size dependence? Wikipedia does not have a page on this phrase. Question 180, what is the lowest optical absorption transition? Wikipedia doesn't have a page on this phrase. Question 181, what are quantum dots? All of that verbiage for something Wikipedia defines as, a quantum dot is a nanocrystal made of semiconductor materials that are small enough to exhibit quantum mechanical properties. I mean, really, what's the point? Could there be a simpler concept? Mind you, someone could make a good buck off a better understanding of semiconductors. Question 182. What is the cause of the non-parabolicity of the energy size dependence for the lowest optical absorption transition of quantum dots? Termites? Do your own research, Semiconductor X. Electronic band structure, next section. Question 183. What are band gaps? Okay, Wikipedia does a pretty good job explaining what they are. Question 184. Why can band gaps not accurately be calculated? Because the theories being used are not right? Try discarding the good old physics that has as many flaws as the single bullet theory. Try modeling with spring and loop theory. Next section, biophysics. Okay, there are three biophysics problems listed here, and none of them seem to be physics problems. So just save you some bother and skip that section. Now we're in the other problems section, and we come to entropy, or the arrow of time. Question 185. Why did the universe have such low entropy in the past? All right, so this question doesn't elaborate, but if you read Sean Carroll's From Eternity to Here, around page 63, he talks about the entropy of the early universes versus today versus what it could be at its maximum. And he put the early universe entropy at 10 to the 88. He says the entropy today, the combined entropy of everything is 10 to the 101, and it could be a maximum of 10 to the 120 if everything in the universe was in a single black hole. So entropy is a measure of randomness, so the theory that we're trying to talk about here 
which is obviously the Big Bang Theory, is saying that at, just before that Big Bang happened, there was very low entropy, supposedly. Well, spring and loop theory is not comfortable with the Big Bang Theory. A very su substantial component of the Big Bang Theory, the inflationary phase, is quite obviously ludicrous. The only reason spring and loop theory tolerates the Big Bang concept at all is that supposedly the magic amounts or ratios of hydrogen and helium in the universe today can only be explained by a Big Bang happening 13.5 billion years ago. That being said, spring and loop theory has no reason to try and reconcile a theoretic entropy figure of 10 to the 88 in the past with today's figure. That is for Big Bang fans to try and justify. Question 186. If the universe had such low entropy in the past, did this result in the distinction between past and future and the second law of thermodynamics? Spring loop theory sees no connection between a theory of what allegedly happened 13 and a half billion years ago and today's world. Let those who make theory X defend theory X. Besides, this question is quite backwards. It gives precedence to a wild theory and then asks if today's more reasonable appearing world is the result of this wild theory. So, no. Question 187. Why are CP violations observed in certain weak force decays but not elsewhere? Spring and loop theory has talked about the deficiencies of other theories. It is somewhat amusing to see how many times their issues appear on this page. Look, you can either hack your weak force theory or adopt a new one. Spring and loop theory will wait over there for you to decide. Question 188. Are CP violations somehow a product of the second law of thermodynamics? I blame the Federal Reserve. Did you know it is a private corporation? Question 189. Are CP violations a separate arrow of time? Let's ask Robin Hood, shall we? On a slightly more serious note, there has been a recent rash of books about time. This is quite odd, considering how flawed our current understanding is of more important things like gravity and dark things and energies and such. Physics these days is in the doldrums. Patch or fantasize seem to be the two main choices for the publish or perish crowd. Spring and loop theory has taken the third choice of introduce a new theory, build on extremely basic and fundamental things, test and expand upon it, and watch how it grows, firm and tall, despite the hurricane force winds of nonsense swirling around it. But spring and loop theory understands the risks involved in the introduction of a new order. The spring and loop theory tree could quite easily be trampled on, uprooted, or stolen, then rebranded. Such is the way of this world, the world of the 1%. Question 190. Are there exceptions to the principle of causality? No, but boy do we love to think otherwise. Can I drink alcohol and not suffer? Can I lie, steal, or cheat and not take a karmic hit? Can I be part of the group controlling the world? The group that takes lying to a new level? That is quite content to turn their collective backs on a billion hungry souls each day? But is not content with controlling 99% of the money supply? So has to vote itself trillion dollar bailouts? So, no again. Question 191. Is there a single possible past? Yes. And there are also more important questions to wrestle with. Question 192. Is the present moment physically distinct from the past and future, or is it merely an emergent property of consciousness? Physically distinct from the past and future. Next section. Question 193. What is the correspondence limit? Wikipedia says the conditions under which quantum and classical physics agree are referred to as the correspondence limit. Question 194. What is quantum chaos? While it's not at all related to the correspondence limit, despite how they are equated in the sentence above. The way this statement above is worded is somewhat like the rule of law, brackets, sometimes called the rule of war, brackets. How about we deal with these two things separately, shall we? By the way, isn't it interesting how much war, humans killing humans, is inserted into our lives? Truly a ubiquitous campaign. Probably 90% of movies involve killing, murder, murder mystery, war, future wars, past wars, superheroes fighting each other, men and women fighting, swearing, and being dishonest with each other. Give me a child until it is five years old and I will make it love war for life. So what is quantum chaos? War. War is quantum chaos. Question 195. Is there a preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics? Uh, could you, you know, go through my theory and choose what you think are the best parts and then just sort of sweep the other parts into the trash? Spring and loop theory would prefer each theory make its own bed and sleep in it. Question 196. What is the superposition of states? Three out of five Wikipedia links in this section have top banners complaining about the issues within those pages. 
Wikipedia. Please clean your room. Quantum mechanics. I don't want to. Alrighty then. Question 197. What is wave function collapse? Sneaky. The complaint banner is halfway down this page. Question 198. What is quantum decoherence? There are two complaint top banners on this page. There are two complaint top banners on this page. Question 199. How does the quantum description of reality, which includes elements such as the superposition of states and wave function collapse or quantum decoherence, give rise to the reality we perceive? Tenuously? Unless you have faith. And a big stick. To beat the non-believers with. Question 200. What is the measurement problem? No complaint banner. It helps that the page is the shortest in this group, and that it defines the problem rather than trying to fix it. Still, an admirable achievement for quantum mechanics. Question 201. What constitutes a measurement which causes the wave function to collapse into a definite state? Personally, I blame Woodrow Wilson. He seems to have felt quite bad after he realized what he had done. Hey, how about them bears? Next section. Theory of everything. Grand unification theory. Question 202. Is there a theory which explains the values of all fundamental physical constants? Not at present, no. Spring loop theory thinks it can get closer than older, slower theories, mainly by tripping them up. Question 203. Is the theory string theory? String theory is a lovely theory for all the other theories. Your theory stinks. Hey, at least I'm not string theory. Good point. You should be thankful your dad had to study string theory when he was a kid, and it was uphill both ways. Thanks, Daddy, for sacrificing so much for us. String theory is the best theory ever invented, except for all the others. So, no. Question 204. Is there a theory which explains why the gauge groups of the standard model are as they are? Won't someone please clean up the mess for us? Question 205. Is there a theory which explains why observed space-time has three spatial dimensions and one dimension of time? How about we just accept it? Consider this the the emperor is in fact wearing clothes response. Because what you are really saying is, our theory requires more dimensions so that we can prop up our theory with one or more truly egregious hacks. So if you could make way dimensions-wise, we would surely appreciate it. Question 206. Is there a theory which explains why all laws of physics are as they are? Spring and loop theory. For most of the laws, anyway. Some laws that don't take into account edge effects, for example, information loss in a black hole, will have to be revised. Other laws that declare the speed of light to be a constant will have to be flat out changed. So yes, yes there is. Question 207. Do fundamental physical constants vary over time? Well, the speed of light does, so yes. Question 208. Are any of the particles in the standard model of particle physics actually composite particles, too tightly bound to observe as such at current experimental energies? Let me fire up the old microscope and have a look. Hmm, it says here, if you can read this, you must have Planck ray vision. So, probably. See what I did there? Question 209. Are there fundamental particles that have not yet been observed? Yes. Question 210. What fundamental particles have not yet been observed? Those ones over there. Question 211. What are the properties of the fundamental particles that have not yet been observed? Boardwalk and park place? Question 212. Are there unobserved fundamental forces implied by a theory that explains other unsolved problems in physics? I hereby bestow the priceless question of the page award on this very question. Wear it proudly, my friend. Next section, Yang-Mills theory, question 213. Given an arbitrary compact gauge group, okay, first the good news, no mention of the Higgs on that gauge group page, but we did encounter yet another thinly disguised attempt by a flawed theory to get someone else to repair it. A Y-A-T-D-A-B-A-F-T-T-G-S-E-T-R-I sighting, call the EPA. Question 214, does a non-trivial quantum Yang-Mills theory with a finite mass gap exist? This problem is also listed as one of the Millennium Prize problems in mathematics. More gauge sightings and a Higgs mention. Bailiff, I want this question removed. Next section, physical information. Question 215, are there physical phenomena such as wave function collapse, which irrevocably destroy information about their prior states? Y-A-T-D-A-B-A-F-T-T-G-S-E-T-R-I. Question 2 and 6. Are there physical phenomena, such as black holes, which irrevocably destroy information about their prior states? 
Yes, as Spring Loop Theory discussed in Cosal 2 Black Holes. Question 217. How is quantum information stored as a state of a quantum system? By a quantum theorist and carefully? Next section. Quantum computation. Question 218. Is David Deutsch's notion of a universal quantum computer sufficient to efficiently simulate an arbitrary physical system? Yes, several times. Next section. Dimensionless physical constant. Question 219. At the present time, the values of the dimensionless physical constants cannot be calculated. They are determined only by physical measurement. What is the minimum number of dimensionless physical constants from which all other dimensionless physical constants can be derived? e to the i pi plus 1. Next question. Question 220. Are dimensionful physical constants necessary at all? Google returned 54,100 pages containing dimensionful. I had no idea and shall endeavor to use the word dimensionful more often. Spring and loop theory thinks there is only one dimensionful physical constant, the speed of light. Planck's constant, a dimensionful constant that relates energy to frequency, is related to the speed of light, i.e. spring-spring bump speed, and frequency, i.e. spring-spring bump speed. Gravity, another dimensionful constant, is similarly derivable by spring and loop theory. By the way, there is a Wikipedia page for Dimensionful, or at least a page that Dimensionful redirects into. Anyway, the strange thing about the Dimensionful page is that it only mentions Dimensionful twice, with the first mention of Dimensionful barely counting as it appears at the top of the Dimensional Analysis page in brackets as redirected from Dimensionful. You see, if you go directly to the Dimensional Analysis page that Dimensionful redirects into, there is no brackets redirected from Dimensionful at the top. So I'll let you decide if that counts as a mention of Dimensionful or not. If it doesn't, then Wikipedia itself only uses the word Dimensionful once on the Dimensionful page. So yes, Dimensionful physical constants are necessary. Next section. Problems solved in recent decades. Solar neutrino problem. Question 221. Does neutrino oscillation solve the solar neutrino problem? Spring and Lupteri enjoys thinking about neutrinos, primarily because it is one of the few truly unsolved problems in physics, despite it appearing in this solved section. For example, just this month, February 2014, Fizz.org had a story about sterile neutrinos. Yes, a new kind. Quoting, a new kind of neutrino called sterile because it has no interaction with other known neutrinos. A sterile neutrino does have mass and so could be responsible for the missing dark matter. So, Spring and Loop Theory thinks we will be pondering neutrinos for quite some time to come. And that is a good thing, because new physics is fun. Age Crisis, 1990s. Question 222. Do better estimates for the distances to the stars and the recognition of the accelerating expansion of the universe reconcile the 3 to 8 billion years younger original age estimates? For what it is worth, Wikipedia doesn't appear to be completely happy with that Age Crisis page. Spring and Loop Theory thinks that the estimated age of the universe, like many other big picture subjects, will continue to change over time. Enjoy the ride. All right, two, two stories came out just as I was finalizing this talk. I've linked uh, to both of them. One is talking about, uh, in the science budget, um, computing is going to be a winner, or it's going to get a lot of funds, and fusion, the fusion projects are not and this backs up my point that repeated point that of the value of simulations to the future of physics that's what the future of physics is all about and then the other one is the rise and fall of supersymmetry it says that the LEC has failed to support supersymmetry so far and I say it's time to stick a fork in it it's done thanks for listening